Simba. Yes. We're here in Venice. You're yes. homeless. Yes. You said you've been homeless since your wife died and you got evicted. Yes. Tell me about it. Well, um, we were living in Fontana and um, we go out fishing quite often because I met my wife fishing. Um, she was Horse Charlie Indian Apache and um, I'm a Blackfoot Indian. And um, she was very, very sick, complications with diabetes. Uh, she needed a, a kidney transplant. She was on the donors list over at USC. And um, what happened was basically she uh, just started having severe relapses. Fluids, her legs started swelling up. Um, jaundice, because the kidney was starting to really act up bad. And um, the doctor said um, I should get ready because she was probably going to pass pretty fast. At the time, I, you know, I, I'm trying to cope with just her being sick like that, but then the point of her dying, I wasn't with that. And so they had this program called hospice and came by the house and talked to me and got me prepared, which I don't think anybody could really be prepared for anything like that, and, you know, so. They knocked on the door, I fell asleep, they knocked on the door, and um, uh, they said that she had passed. And so, I don't know, a lot of things went through my mind, you know, and then the crying started really, really severe, really bad. And then, because this was, you know, my best friend, my fishing friend, you know, my real soulmate. And so I had to deal with all that, you know. And I knew she went to a better place because she, you know, I seen her suffer. But she was a soldier, I'm telling you. My wife, Deborah, was a soldier. So I stayed in my apartment and basically tried to just deal with the depression. You said you got severely depressed. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, really don't understand when they, they see people self-medicate, that means, you know, marijuana or any other type of drugs they think that the person is, is, you know, a loaf or lazy or, you know, some type of criminal. But, you know, a lot of people in America, they have some type of medicine in their cabinets and nobody's calling them a drug addict. When you're dealing with situations like that and being a grown person, you have the right, you know, to, uh, within the mentality of what you can handle, just be able to try to get through situations. And sometimes, you know, smoking marijuana is what's it was able to help me, yeah. you know, sleep. And uh, they would smell the stuff in the hallway. I said to myself, if there was a cancer patient here, you know, I hope you wouldn't be complaining like that. Yeah. But and this is four years ago. Now marijuana is common, but four years ago. Yeah, um, it was right where certain things like uh, no smoking laws were starting to take on a different kind of mandate in the apartments. And it was really rough on people who had been smoking for years. Yeah. They were out there smoking. On the corner, around the buildings, it was really kind of, you know, very discontented for them. So, so basically, they used that as a platform, and they evicted me, and they gave me actually a 30-day notice when I was supposed to get a 60-day notice. And a couple of things were kind of impaired; it wasn't right, quite legal. And the lawyer said, "Well, you know, we have a case here; you can win this." But I didn't have that. I didn't have the money, so I went homeless. They won the case, and I went homeless. And, now I'm depressed and on this crying spell yeah. and don't have a place to stay and um, wandering. And so I said to myself, you know, there are homeless people out here and I think I better get myself busy and just start working with them because... What was your first night homeless like? Well, I stepped at the Metrolink and um, it's basically just sat on one of the benches and leaned back and just went to sleep. Yeah, but how did it feel? How did you feel? Well, waking up in the morning with all the life, um, without any more structure in my life, any more surety about how my day was going to go, because we did a lot of fishing. And that page was completely torn out of my life, and I was just stuck. And Woke up and tears started. Tears started immediately. Started just kind of taking on my day, you know. I just go for walks, man. Just walk and you know, try to figure out 
how God was going to talk to me, you know, because I knew he could. But I was angry, man. I was really, really angry. And to tell you the truth, you know, that until I admitted it, I was angry at my father because I, I, I just didn't know why I had to be by myself. But then I, I, I seen so many people trying to get on the bandwagon. It was weird that I said it like that because it was all about the money. It was all about what they could inherit. I couldn't believe that, man. And I watched his witnesses and then I realized he was actually doing this because he needed for people to not be playing with the idea of going to church and knowing religion, but you don't know God. It's not in your heart. When you're talking about money, as this person's dying in front of you, he's supposed to be a family member. So, fortunately, I came out a little short on the deal because I lost a very good companion, man. Yes. I'm so sorry. I thank you. I thank you. And, I, and it helps, man, when people care when they say things, you know, and, and they say it from the heart. But there was a, I learned a lot about people when you lose somebody. Some people are straight heartless, man. Huh? Yeah. Some people shouldn't say anything, but to say something to somebody in the light of them, they knowing their life is just split in half. And yeah. My and mom passed away in May, and yesterday was the first holiday without her. And all I can't relate to what you went through, uh, but I got to tell you, when I, you lose a loved one, it's a hole. It's a hole that remains with you. Well, since I've been here, just like two weeks, three weeks ago, I went over to San Monica Pier, and um, I made closure, you know, with my mother. Prayed to her and told her how much I loved her and everything. Yeah. Remember, she, she took us out to our first fishing trips right there at, at Santa Monica Pier. Yeah. You're saying your mom brought you here at the Oh, yeah. Pier. Oh, yeah. yeah, Santa Monica Pier. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were, I mean, we were raised on that pier. And, um, I mean, we had a lot of good times as a family, you know. Yeah. And, uh. Well, how are you surviving homelessness? How are you surviving out here? Well, one thing that I do uh, to kind of take my mind off the uh, obvious is I go dumpster diving. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And God said, I will give you the desires of your heart. It just so happens that he gives it to me uh, in a trash can. And uh, uh, quite as it's kept, my grandmother actually taught me um, uh, the power of thrift, meaning the power of living off the land and using the resources that people throw away every day. Yeah. And as you can see all the things that are behind me, I would say yeah. most of all this stuff I found. Yeah. But sometimes it can be overwhelming. They call that hoarding. And as you try to work out the blessing with the curse, it becomes a tug of war. You know, and you try to work it out because you still want it to be community friendly. And you have to just still think of others and not yourself. So, uh, that within uh, itself has been a tough road, just balancing that out. How many years young are you? I'm 65 years old. You're 65. This is no way. I know you're surviving with dumpster diving, but this is not, it should not be your retirement years. No, it shouldn't. For anybody. For anybody. At my age, I think, after 50, people who have experienced um, incontinent were... Uh, it's very difficult to hold your urine because the, the nerves that are down there, they start getting very, you know, stressed so and old. And you, you're having body. health issues. Health issues and the embarrassment sometimes can be totally overwhelming, you know. Um, oh, my God. And I, I people tell me that I should go live in a van all the time, and I'm like, you know, I'm almost 60, and my, my bladder is not... So I can't imagine what it must be like out here as a senior. When you don't have uh, adequate facilities uh, to be able to be mindful of the elderly, you're missing and you're missing the mark where it comes to how America should be watching over there. The people that have already paid their dues have already built this America's and. 
just look for someone to understand. You know, they're still here, you know what I'm saying? And what is left of their mentality, depending on how people talk to them, when it comes to appreciating the sacrifice they've made every day. And so when you, when you take that out of the equation, people die too fast. Yeah. They die from depression or suicide, and they just give up hope. Yeah, I mean, the feeling, people ask me what was homelessness like, and I, I always, it's, I can't describe it in words, but I would always say the feeling of hopelessness is overwhelming. The feeling? Mom, be careful. The feeling of being able to handle a constant gnawing in your heart, in your mind that it's going to be a roadblock. There's not going to be any progression. I mean, how do you handle it continuously when you know that every day, given on this earth, on land, and you see people living a normal lives, that you are not here because your mind is not receptive to anything guaranteed of movement, of something something happy and something lasting over 24 hours. There, within 24 hours, 40, 48 hours. We are so challenged that most of this will never be filmed. You have no idea, it will never be filmed. Because to understand the mindset of someone homeless is to think of the most ultimate heroes, men and women, how we try our best to look and act like we have stabilized lives. Yeah. Well, and when I walked up and a mutual friend was, you had a really nice white like tux on, but you got a little cupcake because she was handing everybody cupcakes in exchange. <laughs> But that's what we were talking about, how you really work hard to not look homeless. The idea of love being away from us is devastating. But there's certain people like moms who's here today that we love this woman because she is the ultimate mother figure. It, it, behooves everybody to know that they should be telling their moms and their family members so much they love them now for this person to come out and reach out to so many people and just sacrifice her time to make sure that they know that being a mother figure takes coming on the front line in the grubbies of, of the dirty or whatever this street in this area is sending but let you know you are protected I got you and my arms are big enough, I got you, I am, I, my wings, I got you underneath here. Just come on. Yeah, and she has been a motivating force that everyone sees and loves her very much for that. Yeah. That right there is something that makes the next step, the next step, not easy, but it, it, it is worth trying. Because hopeless doesn't just go out the door. Right. She has stepped in, the, in in front of the lion and whatever beast that was here and said, those are mine, yeah. you know. Providing respect and dignity. She brings vegetables, fruits and vegetables down here and she, she lifts up that stuff. And I know her back hurts sometimes, yeah. but she doesn't even complain. And she still tells us, you know, it's going to be okay. What would you want these people that are driving by who judge you sitting sitting here? What would you want them to know about homelessness? I think everybody who's ever been on a camping trip knows that after maybe a week, two weeks, even three weeks, that's enough. Let's go back home. But for us, we've had to make that blue sky our roof. We had to make this asphalt jungle a place where we have to constantly thinking about how can we clean it better? Because we are in some type of a pit that it takes us to make sure we don't let it cling to us or touch to us like it did these streets. So as we help one another, try our best to support one another mentally and tell each other and show each other that I care, 
And I'm only here because you're still here. And as long as you're still here, I can't move on because I don't want nothing to happen. If I move on and come back and I left too soon, the people need to realize that the clock ticks very loud when we have to deal with this every day, which a lot of us don't know what day it is. We don't know what time it is. We don't know anything what's happening out there. That's real. So basically, we're in another type of a world. Yeah. As long as we're human beings and have a soul, they need to show a lot more understanding and compassion yeah. because it could be any one of their kids out here one day, one of their relatives maybe distant short on the streets, and you want this homelessness to go away, meaning you want it to get fixed from the core yeah. so that it spreads from here all the way to Los Angeles in every city around the world. That is if we come up with the remedy. And it takes real dedicated people who naturally can do this without bad an eyebrow. Could yeah. wanna, and it's never about the money. Never. It's about us. Yeah. And they know that. If you had three wishes, what would they be? First, that the mother figures around the world get appreciative, rather appreciated. That's the word I was trying to say, appreciate it. That don't let them hurt anymore seeing their kids, which to them will always be their kids, suffer anymore. Jesus died of a broken heart. And I can see that, it, I see the gray hairs coming prematurely so fast. They might not say it, but we know it, that it needs to happen sooner than later because they can't handle too much of their heart skipping beats and not sure if we're going to be taken care of. Yeah. It means a lot that they are appreciated more in every day. The second wish is that something happened to the structure that we live in. We can't keep walking down our streets thinking a police officer is a terrorist. It used to be a time where serve and protect it was mandated. You hire the right people, and because the people cared about the protection that was watching over them, everybody watched each other and watched each other back. Now, they have targeted certain people that are homeless, and it makes them feel, makes us feel that we can be killed or mistreated at any time. We don't look at the police officers as heroes anymore. We're very cautious and we're protective of ourselves. We're quiet. We don't try to do anything. They give them the impression that we're going to do anything wrong. But as I walked down to that uh, shoreline down that way, I seen some officers that look like they have no problem of putting the gun to your head and getting rid of what they call a problem. That's got to change. Because this is not a third world country where we should feel that a police officer or any agency should look at us as terrorists. We're homeless. We're no threat. The most thing I tell people is make sure you clean up your trash in case you go trash digging. But we don't, we don't think of violence. We're not trying to rob nobody. That's not on our program. But we are surviving the best way we can. And they know right from wrong. And they, let me tell you something, they are the backbone of the community. They're woke. 24 hours sometime a day, and they know what riffraff comes in, and they know what riffraff get, they can run out of here. Because yeah. they're not, they're not gonna have it. Yeah. That community is a part of this community, and vice versa. Yeah. And the last wish is this, that every man, woman, and child around the world be thankful this holiday, and we thank the ones who have come down here and really offered their services. I wish that each one of these households First responders, people who came down here, be blessed and let their cups be overflowing. But let the other one's hearts be softened by the example that prejudice never should have rose this ugly head in our city, never should have happened. We don't possess that, that genetics. We love all people, but we don't love evil, and we're not going to support wickedness, but we love all people and color has never ever been a problem with us never so that's it great wishes thank you very much for talking to me thank you too bro